Welcome to another episode of Angiopod. We left episode 4 with a nice discussion on abdominal aortic aneurysms, and we are going to continue that discussion in this episode, but we have a special guest joining us today, Dr. Jonathan Shore. Dr. Shore is the program director for the Vascular Fellowship at Staten Island University Hospital. He completed his general surgery residency from NYU and then moved on to UMDNJ to complete his vascular fellowship. He's going to discuss his approach to a rupture triple A along with Dr. Singh. But before that, we're going to discuss some important trials on open versus endovascular repair of abdominal aortic aneurysms. Let's get started. Dr. Singh, the big question for today is, what is the data that compares open and endovascular abdominal aortic aneurysm repair? So this is something that not just the residents, but the attendings also, you know, often debate about. And different countries, in fact, uh, have different ways that uh, how these aneurysms should be treated. Some say that in younger patients, we should use open and uh, in older patients, maybe that are higher risk for post-op complications and endovascular options should be should be chosen. And uh, some believe that as long as the anatomy is suitable, r- irrespective of the age, we should probably use an endovascular approach. So there are certain trials that we should know about uh, because there really isn't a consensus as of now. Uh, one of the trials that I want to talk about is an EVAR one. So there's a few of them we'll talk about. You don't have to know all the details, but these may come up in conversation. So I think it is important for residents and fellows to at least be aware of it. So if you're talking about the EVAR1 trial, so these are o- older trials, but the EVAR1 essentially looked at endovascular repair versus open repair and looked at mortality rates. Uh, in short term, uh, less than six months, they noted that patients that underwent an endovascular repair had approximately 8% mortality rate versus a 15% mortality rate with an open repair. However, in long term, there was a higher reintervention rate as uh, as expected with the EVAR group, 4% versus 2% compared to open. Uh, but when you looked at, follow these patients long term, they realized that there was no difference in mortality rates compared endovascular versus open. So that's one of the, the trials that we should know about. Another one is called the DREAM trial or the DUTCH trial. This also compared, uh, this was a randomized trial, multi-center compared endovascular versus open. And they all also realized that between the two groups, there was no statistical significance in terms of mortality. However, in the endovascular group, in the long term, there was a higher reintervention rate. So those are the those two main trials that we should talk about. So Dr. Singh, the other question that I have for you is, what about patients that are too frail to undergo an open repair? Uh, do you think doing an endovascular repair on them has any benefit? Well, if you look at the trials, the biggest trial for that type of uh, situation is the EVAR2 trial, which randomized patients into a, an endovascular group and patients without any intervention, just medical management, because these patients were too high risk. So again, we're talking about high risk patients and what with an aneurysm, what you should do. So that's what an EVAR2 trial looked at, endovascular repair versus just medical management and see how they do over time. And what they realized is that over a two-year time period, there was no survival benefit in either, I guess, in either group. So in other words, same mortality rate in two years between the endovascular group or the patients that were medically managed. The limitation of this study was that there was no clear definition of high risk so we don't really know exactly which patients uh, they were considering high risk, number one. Number two, the type of grafts that they were used were older generation grafts. But that being said, in a patient that has a large aneurysm that is very sick and that has a suitable endovascular anatomy, I think everybody would choose endovascular approach because a shorter hospital stay, less blood loss. These patients in the short term just have a much lower mortality. Gotcha. So Dr. saying bigger the aneurysm size, the more challenging the anatomy becomes. What about fixing these aneurysms earlier on endovascularly that would benefit the patient and makes the procedure much less complicated rather than having a really, really large aneurysm that has uh, an angulated neck. I'm, I'm sure when these aneurysms are smaller, the angulation is relatively less and it's uh, easier anatomy to fix. Well, AJ, since we're talking about trials, uh, I think I know what you're, which way you're going and you're trying to get me to talk about the small aneurysm trial. It's a UK trial. Yeah, looks like you've been doing your research. And the thing about this trial is they only looked at patients that underwent open operations. So essentially what they did is they looked at patients uh, that were low risk, 60 to 75 years old, and they randomized them into an open surgery 
and medical management. Again, these aneurysms were less than 5.4 centimeters, anywhere from 4 to 5.4. Anything smaller than 4, they did not treat. So when they looked at all-cause mortality of about seven years or so, they realized there was no difference in survival rate. In fact, patients that underwent an open operation of aneurysms less than 5.4 actually had overall mortality slightly higher, although it wasn't statistically significant, but it was slightly higher than the medical management group. Now, one thing to remember is that three quarters of all the patients that were in the medical management group with the small aneurysms eventually underwent a repair of their aneurysms. Now, the other thing to remember is this is an old trial. This ended, I think, in 1995 or 1997. So these are very old trials, but these are landmark trials and, and you should be aware of them. Again, the small UK trial just looked at open versus surveillance or medical management. And now if you look at, so then the, that sort of begs the question, well, what if we treat these patients that are low risk, small aneurysms with an endovascular therapy versus surveillance? Well, there are some trials out there that you should look into the CSER trial and the Pivotal trial, which have also shown really no difference in mortality compared surveillance to endovascular therapy for small aneurysms. And with all that combined, this is the reason why we treat uh, patients that are 5.5 centimeters and above, or we perform surveillance on them uh, when they're smaller than that size. So with all that being said, AJ, I just want to make a comment that these trials are older trials. They're landmark historic trials, you should know them, but they are they are older. You need to make a decision wh whether that data is accurate or not. Reason being, those devices that were used were older devices. The, the medical management of these might not be the same, and there's really uh, no clear definition of what's considered high risk or not. So you need to make that decision on your own. There is more and more data coming out that you need to look at. But, you know, all that being said, there is also some evidence that when the aneurysms are smaller and there is a better neck, that may be the time to treat them with an endovascular therapy uh, because over time, these aneurysms do get larger and they become more difficult to treat, especially once the neck becomes smaller. And uh, now we're talking about fenestrated and snorkels and you know other uh, measures that we may have to do to treat these aneurysms. But again, it's a moving target and there is new literature coming out all the time. So for the next segment, I'd like to bring up uh, ruptured AAA and the approach. And we actually have a special guest on the show today, Dr. Jonathan Shore. He is the program director for the Vascular Fellowship at Staten Island University Hospital. He's joining us today remotely, of course, because of the corona situation. And uh, we're going to ask him what his approach is to a ruptured AAA. Dr. Shore, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And please... Tell us how you would approach a ruptured AAA. So first of all, thank you very much for having me, for inviting me to be on the podcast today. When we're talking about a ruptured AAA, there are really two different types of ruptured AAA. There's the stable and the unstable patient. And the approach to each one is different. When we're talking about a stable, hemodynamically stable patient, our first preference is to try and get a CT scan with intravenous contrast um, to get a better sense of what the aneurysm morphology and the anatomy is prior to making a decision of what the best approach to repairing those aneurysms are. Once we have the CT scan, we can see if the patient is a candidate at that point for an endovascular repair versus an open repair. And of course, the guidelines for a, for a repair is certainly impacted by the whether there is a neck on the aneurysm of sufficient length to support an endograft. In this situation, of course, I, my preference is to try, uh, when the patient is stable, to try and do a endovascular repair because these kind of patients have a lower short-term mortality and there's a lot less blood loss when treating these kind of patients. When we're talking about a unstable patient, of course, the rules are a little different. If we have information regarding a recent CAT scan, that is great, if preferably within the past 30 days. However, we often don't have that information. And if the patient is okay to go to CAT scan, it can be stabilized and resuscitated and go to CAT scan, that is preferable because, as I, as I said before, the endovascular repair is preferred if it can be done safely on these kind of patients. Uh John, we should mention that we're talking about, uh, I guess, different equipment. So those that deal with the hybrid 
setting uh, might not know what we're talking about. Why send them to a CAT scan? Why not just bring them right up? They may have that fusion technology where they can scan them on the table and fix them on the table. But I think majority of the places uh, deal with C-arm type of situation where they need to get the CAT scan and then wheel the patient up to the operating room and then uh, repair it at that time. With that being said, so so what if you don't have any information and we're often in this type of a situation where the patient's unstable, they are, have abdominal pain or back pain, and you get a call from the emergency room and they, they tell you, well, we did a bedside ultrasound and we see fluid in the belly. How do you deal with that kind of a situation? So in this kind of situation, in that kind of situation where you have absolutely no information, the patient, it, all you have is an ultrasound. My first preference would be to plan on an open repair. You know, it'd be great if you had a hybrid technology to bring the patient up and do a CT scan on the table. But for most most people, this is not uh, feasible, especially in the middle of the night. It's very difficult to do that. It's In that situation, we should probably, uh, what I would do is plan for an open repair uh, of the aneurysm. And depending on the stability of the patient, the first preference would be to try and get um, balloon control of the aorta to try and allow anesthesia a moment to resuscitate the patient in order to improve the patient's hemodynamics prior to opening the patient and releasing the retroperitoneum, which uh, could cause a significant amount of blood loss in a, a quick fashion when you're dealing with a true ruptured aneurysm. Uh, so I'm glad you brought that up, balloon occlusion. How do you do that? And I'm sure there's some general surgery residents that want to hear about this too, because this also applies to a trauma situation. How do you get that blue? Uh, what, what type of sheath do you need? And uh, are there any tricks that you like to use to, to do that? Yeah, so I agree with you, Kuldeep. This is one of those things that really is been talked about in the trauma literature. The idea of doing a quick balloon occlusion of the aorta when you have a patient who's hemodynamically unstable and you're suspecting a major vascular injury. Um, the best way to do this, the first thing you need is the aortic occlusion balloon. And there are a number of different companies that make a similar balloon. There's Medtronic and they have the Reliant balloon. There's the Coda balloon by Cook. It really doesn't matter. What you need is a non-compliant aortic occlusion balloon that's often the same kind of balloon that's used to do a post-angioplasty on a endovascular aneurysm repair. Those balloons generally go through either a, somewhere between a 11 and a 14 French sheath, depending on the size. In an emerging situation, the truth is, just put the biggest sheath you can put in. Uh, usually a 14 French sheath is sufficient, either a 12 or a 14, either one is sufficient. It can be done either percutaneous or via a cut down. My general preference is if the patient is reasonably stable to try and do it percutaneously and the reason to do that is it does it, it does cut down on the procedural time getting complete control of the artery prior to uh, putting in the balloon what you tend to do is first get access to the femoral artery and put the wire up under fluoroscopy up into the thoracic aorta you can then deliver your sheath and usually it would prefer to take a long sheath the same type that is used i think it's a 20 centimeter sheath that is used for a endovascular aneurysm repair and Bring that sheath all the way up into the proximal, into the distal thoracic aorta. Then through over the wire to put the balloon on, inflate the balloon to obtain control and, and leave the balloon just above the top of the sheath. That prevents the balloon from being pushed down by the aortic pressure. Leaving that balloon there, then allow anesthesia a moment to catch up. Hopefully at that point, the blood pressure can be stabilized. So at that point, then you can decide how you're going to repair the aneurysm. Keeping that balloon up there allows sort of get some control over the bleeding while the anesthesiologist has a moment to uh, resuscitate the patient adequately. Yeah, that's a great explanation and, and, and a great point about using a long sheath that comes up. And the reason I'm assuming you're talking about a long sheath is by putting in a short sheath, the pulsations, the aortic pulsations can actually push the balloon down. And all of a sudden, the patient becomes hypotensive and you can't figure out why. Sometimes I like to put a little contrast in the balloon. Uh, this way you can see where that balloon is, is hanging out. And sometimes you see that balloon is now sitting in the aneurysm and it's gotten pushed down. So I'm assuming that's why you were saying using a long sheath, correct? Yes, that's correct. The other trick I have is, is to make sure to put a three-way stopcock on the back end of the inflation port um, and to lock that stopcock and make sure that everyone on the table knows what position that is to keep the balloon inflated. Otherwise, the balloon will deflate from its own pressure will allow it to deflate by locking it off and making sure everyone on the table, you can prevent an error from happening during the case uh, while you're operating to end up with a lot of bleeding and instability of a patient. That's a very good, uh, very good trick.
Kuldeep, well, one thing I neglected to mention earlier, when we're talking about a ruptured AAA, when we don't have any other information, when we have a patient from the emergency room, I think it's important that we try, if it's possible, to get at least some imaging on the patient to make sure that our diagnosis is correct. Uh, very often, a quick abdominal ultrasound done by an experienced or even a moderately experienced technician is very helpful to at least confirm that the free fluid that you see in the abdomen is surrounding the aorta. One thing about uh, ruptured aneurysms is ultrasound can give you a lot of information and it's really easy to see. On most patients, the aorta with free fluid around it, which certainly points to that being the correct diagnosis and certainly makes you concerned they have to take the patient emergently to the operating room. Yeah, very good point. It's also worth to look at old scans. Sometimes these uh, can be missed, but you find it on an old CAT scan or an old study that was there. So, you know, but your points are excellent. Uh, one thing, John, we should talk about our trials, right? It, that this sort of begs the question, well, what's better, an open operation or an endovascular? But I guess before we talk about trials, why don't we talk about an open approach? Well, my preference is on a rupture is obviously, as we talked about earlier, trying to get balloon control if it's possible when the patient is very unstable. But when you have to do an open repair, I think the first order of business is to determine how you're going to get proximal control of the neck of the aorta or even any proximal control of the aorta to stop the bleeding that's going to cause the patient to be unstable and the real initial problem have to deal with. Usually, my approach is a midline laparotomy and be generous with the incision. Um, all the way up from the xiphoid process down to the uh, symphysis and, and to enter the abdomen. And first order is to try and get proximal control. And the way to do that is to define the aorta, the cruise of the diaphragm, in this, to get to what we often refer to as supraceliac control. And the way to do that is to enter through the lesser sac and to mobilize the left portion of the liver and find the aorta right at the cruise of the diaphragm. Once you can get to that point, you could even use just a sponge stick or someone's hand to just grab down and feel the aorta. One of the key things is be careful when you're trying to get control of the aorta over there because the esophagus runs right in that same location. So you need to use some finger dissection to make sure the esophagus is freed away from the aorta. Usually at that point, you can use some finger control or even a sponge on a stick to at least get some temporary control of the aorta while you go back to try and get the inferenal aorta with most aneurysms that are ruptured uh, where the neck is of the aneurysm. Yeah, these can be very challenging, especially if it's free rupture. But, you know, a lot of times uh, these are contained ruptures, so you can take your time. Uh, you just need to be careful and you need to be very diligent because once you open up that sac, you can turn that uh, contained rupture into a free rupture. Now you have yourself a problem. Uh, one thing to mention is don't forget about either femoral or iliac control. So uh, you don't want to open up the sac thinking that you have good proximal control and then you forgot about uh, iliac control and then you have torrential back bleeding. One other thing it to remember is if you can see the size of the IMA, if it's, a, if it's a significant size IMA and you can control the proximal neck and you have iliac control as well and you open up the sac and you still have significant bleeding, you know, this can come from lumbars, but it can also come from the IMA as well if it's a uh, generous size IMA. Yeah, and I think that talking about the IMA in a rupture situation, we often don't even really consider it, although... We should at least take a look at it if the patient is stable enough, even in a rupture situation, to look to make sure if the IMA A is patent, which it often is not in the setting of an aneurysm because of the mural thrombus usually includes it. If it is patent, we should check what the back bleeding is to determine if it needs to be reimplanted. Now, in a free rupture and an unstable patient, just ligate it and go away uh, and continue. But in a situation where you have a more of a contained rupture and you have a stable patient, you often will have time if that artery needs to be reimplanted, you'll have time to reimplant it. Yeah, very good point. I mean, I guess we can talk about this all day, but one other question, and uh, this is an interesting one. What if you have a patient and the belly is significantly distended? I mean, it's like rock hard, but you got a CAT scan and the CAT scan shows good endovascular anatomy and you choose to fix this in an endovascular fashion. What do you do in that situation? And, you know, I guess you know what I'm talking about, which would be compartment syndrome. How do you deal with that situation? 
So in that situation, what I would do is just repair the aneurysm by using an endovascular graft. Once you complete the endovascular graft, that will actually get control of the bleeding for you. So you're not dealing with an expanding hematoma. And very often when that happens, a patient needs to have a decompressive laparotomy. And do that, you have just do another midline incision. You leave the abdomen open and allow the bowel to open up beyond the abdominal cavity to release the compartment syndrome. At some point, a couple of days later, usually you can bring the patient back once the edema and some of the hematoma has resolved and close the abdomen. Yeah, uh, great points. Dr. Singh, you mentioned the trials comparing open versus endovascular repair for specifically for ruptured AAAs. Let's go back to that and talk about any trials that discuss that topic. One major, I guess, since we're talking about landmark trials, is a, the IMPROVE trial. So this was, I think it was published in 2013. Uh, but this IMPROVE trial was a randomized controlled trial, and it looked uh, roughly at 300 patients that underwent open and endovascular repair for a ruptured aneurysm. And essentially what they found is 30-day mortality really, sh- there was no statistical significance whether you treated them in an endovascular or an open fashion. However, when they looked at subgroup analysis, they did show some benefit in the EVAR group in the 30-day mortality of females with a 37% versus 57% mortality rate. Also, just like uh, some of the other trials that we talked about, open versus endo, endovascular repair is always, always going to have a higher reintervention rate in the longer term. So one other subtype of aneurysms that are rare, but most of the younger trainees, especially the junior general surgery residents, uh, as well as the medical students get confused about is inflammatory or the other type, the infected aneurysms that we sometimes have to deal with. Uh, what are your thoughts on these two subtypes? So. These two aneurysms are different. They're of different etiology, and I think it's important to note that. An infecting aneurysm is secondary to an an infection. That could be, sometimes that's from a prior history of some sort of an aneurysm repair that gets infected, or it's an infected aorta secondary usually to a remote infection. It can be from endocarditis or an infected valve, which can then see the aorta and end up with an infected aneurysm. These can either present as ruptured aneurysms or even um, just as patients with fever and an expanding aneurysm. Those cases uh, that are infected need to be treated differently than any other kind of aneurysm because you can't uh, repair that aneurysm with a graft material in the abdomen. You really want to avoid that situation if you can. The most common way to repair this is to first do an axillary bifemoral artery bypass and then the laparotomy and excise the infected portion of the aorta and over the aortic stump and to remove all infected material to debris the, any infected material, wash it out and then keep the patient on antibiotics. And that's the usual first treatment. Of course, that's not the only treatment. There are a couple of other options including using a rifampin-soaked graft, which has been described, or using a homograft. There's another procedure called the NASE procedure, which is a procedure where a piece of the femoral vein is fashioned into a neo-aorta and then implanted and using the patient's own tissue as an autograft to replace the aorta. And that's a situation to uh, maintain inline flow from the uh, inferior aorta down into the legs. John, since I think these are important topics, especially for the was taking the oral boards. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the NACE procedure is done? And also, you said first you need to do an ax by fem and then go ahead and approach the infected aneurysm. If you could just tell us some of the details, how to do it, you know, what's the timing? Do you wait a day? Do you do it at the same time? Give us a little bit more information this way for people that are taking the oral boards, they can describe these a little bit better. So it's a good point. Let's just start with um, how to do the axillary bifemoral bypass. If the patient's not ruptured, the patient has a infected aneurysm, Aneurysm, it's always best to try and stage these patients and to do first the axillary bifemoral bypass. It's best to get some sort of imaging of the upper extremities to find out, make sure the patient doesn't have pre existing occlusive disease. Usually, the incision is an infraclavicular incision and the bypass comes off the axillary artery in the chest, and then the graft is tunneled along the uh, anterior axillary line to the groin. You cut down on both groins to get control of the femoral arteries and do a bifemoral bypass. Usually is done with a ringed PTFE bypass graft. 
And usually it's best to wait a few days after you do that before going in to do the debridement and wash out of the abdomen if that can be done. And that's not always possible. Sometimes the patients are unstable and can be pretty sick. So if you have to do it in one stage, it, it can be done. The best way to do that is hopefully to have two teams because it's a long operation and being able to decrease the operative time in a patient who is uh, potentially quite sick is very helpful. So John, that's- Sorry, just, sorry to cut you off. Just a quick question. When you're talking about an ax by fem, and then you said wait a day or two, is there any threat of occlusion of that bypass with competitive flow, and how do you manage it? Usually it doesn't happen, although it can. I just maintain the patient's blood pressure. I don't usually try, I try and bring the patient back within 24 hours. Usually in that situation, don't really have a problem with competitive flow in that short period of time. If you have, again, it could anticoagulate the patient, but in a setting, it's not necessary to anticoagulate the patient. Right. I guess something to mention about that is you can potentially ligate the common femoral artery above your ax by fem. But remember, when you're going in the belly and then you're resecting the infected aneurysm, you may not be able to perfuse the hypogastric. So that is something to remember. Right. Which is why we don't usually do it. Right. Um, Usually try and wait. Usually in 24 hours, you're not going to have that problem. When you resect the aneurysm, you will resect the inflow to it and prevent that competitive flow once you've oversown the aorta. Right. And then uh, the other thing that we wanted to talk about was inflammatory aneurysms, right? How do you manage those? Is that similar to infected aneurysms? On a CAT scan, they can look kind of similar, although they are different. The etiology is different. One is from an infectious process. And in that situation that you're dealing with an infection, you have to debride and resect the entire uh, infected uh, portion of the aorta. When you're dealing with an inflammatory aneurysm, where which on a CAT scan looks a little different, you don't have the same sort of thickening and circumferential thickening. Also, on an infected aneurysm, you often will see air around the aorta, which is a which is a clue that you may be dealing with infectious process. Inflammatory aneurysm is usually secondary to an autoimmune or an inflammatory process. In that situation, it's not infected, so these can be treated in the same way that you would treat a standard aneurysm. You can use an endograft or you can decide to do an open repair. And an open repair can be a little tricky though on these patients because of the inflammation you often will have. That. You can even have the duodenum or even the renal vein really keys down onto the aorta and you really need to be careful about trying to dissect those, those structures away because that dissection itself can be brought with danger of creating either an enterotomy or even a tear in the renal vein, which you really want to avoid. So you really just want to take the aneurysmal portion and deal with that and do as little dissection as you can if you have to do an open repair on an inflammatory aneurysm. Yeah, also important to mention is usually a retroperitoneal approach is preferred in these aneurysms because you can have you know a lot of the structures adhesed that you uh, might not want to touch and get yourself in a bad situation. One other thing we talked about infected aneurysms are the organisms that are involved. These are usually infected with salmonella or, or a staph type of organism. So that is something to remember. Not always the case, but those are the most common. One last thing, John, if you could just tell us about the NACE procedure. How is that done? And I think that's a good board question too. People know about it, but they don't know exactly how it's done because it's typically not done. And I think it takes a very long time and it's very yeah, and that's also, morbid procedure. Yeah. Uh, Colleen, it's a good point. Um, and that's also, I mentioned before using two teams, this is a the classic example of a case that really needs two teams to get this done. What you do is you have to harvest the patient's femoral vein and ligate it proximally and distally and actually resect the femoral vein and use that, usually use a 24 French chest tube, wrap the vein around the chest tube and sew it in a circular fashion to create a new tube for the aorta. The morbidity in the procedure is pretty high because taking out the femoral vein, obviously the patient reduces blood return out of the leg and the patient could have significant leg swelling from doing that. And it does take quite some time to fashion the aorta. Usually this is done in two teams. One will resect and and take out that portion of the vein, start making the neo-aorta while the other team is working in the abdomen and getting control of the aorta and resecting and debriding all the devitalized tissue. And that point, hopefully done almost at the same time and be ready to implant the uh, the new graft, the autograph. Yeah, good point, John. Thank you for that description. It was very good. Great, John. Thank you very much. Anyway, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And we'll talk soon. Will do. Thanks, John. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, well, that was nice to have 
Dr. Shore on the podcast, and I think he did a really nice job. Actually, while we had him on, we should have asked him about iliac artery aneurysms as well. But AJ, why don't you tell us about iliac artery aneurysms? Most commonly, the iliac artery aneurysms that we've seen have been associated with AAA, and that's why I wanted to cover it within this episode. Uh, but we also do see isolated iliac artery aneurysms. The most common segment of the iliac arteries that will be involved will be the common iliac artery, which is about 70 to 90 percent, and then the internal iliac artery, which is 10 to 30 percent. The external iliac artery are rare, under 5 percent. We do repair these when the size is over 3.5 centimeter and the reason is that once you have a rupture of the iliac artery it is uh, highly morbid as well as uh, a lethal complication of these aneurysms. When we have a size less than 3.5 centimeters the SVS guidelines are to follow these aneurysms with a duplex ultrasound. Again these are considered intra-abdominal aneurysms, so they have a propensity to rupture, and it's about a 33% risk at, you know, about 3 centimeter size with a mortality of up to 60%. So what about repair? Uh, what are your options? Uh, the options, we have the open as well as the endovascular option. Again, the anatomy, like Dr. Singh, you mentioned in our bonus episode, is key for anything vascular. So here again, you need to have the landing zones if you're planning an endovascular repair. So again, if it's an isolated common iliac artery aneurysm with good two to three centimeter landing zones, both proximal and distal, you can repair them endovascularly. If you don't have a distal neck and the aneurysm involves the internal iliac, we do have the branch devices that we can use to cover the aneurysms or the other option is to cover the in, uh, internal iliac uh, altogether but you have to make sure you embolize it otherwise you have back bleed into the aneurysmal sac. Yeah very good point. Also don't forget if you have an aneurysm of the common iliac artery and it's adjacent to the aorta how would you fix that? Well you would have to fix the aorta if it's aneurysmal yeah, that's right. So uh, if there's no landing room, uh, then you essentially have to treat that aorta as if it's aneurysmal. If it's a completely normal aorta, you can get away with a few things. One is using a, a bifurcated uh, graft, like such as an endologics, where you don't need to necessarily treat it all the way up to the neck. Other options are just treat it like a normal aortic aneurysm, or if the patient is healthy enough and they're skinny enough, and uh, you can get to that artery in an open fashion, you can do it, treat it in open fashion and retroperitoneal incision. And that works out pretty well. Yeah. The open option is, again, always an option. And you basically will replace the disease segment or aneurysmal segment with an endograft. Yeah, very good. That is it for this episode. A big thank you to Dr. Shore for taking time out to join us today. In case you guys like the history of surgery as much as I do, there is a really nice podcast on surgery legends with a history into the giants of surgery. Give them a listen. If you enjoy listening to us, spread the word and tell your friends and colleagues about this podcast. Also, all of you dealing with COVID-19 patients, take care and stay safe.